Hey, I'm Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy. Normally, we do a lot of geeky talk about TOS and a bunch of science and anatomy and all that uh, fun stuff. For me, it's fun. Today, we're going to take a little bit of a different angle. Uh, We have with us an amazing young man named Jake Markham, who's been a swimmer for most of his life. And Jake has a great story to tell us about TOS. Uh, I want to welcome all our viewers. Thank you for coming again. We really appreciate your support. And Jake, good afternoon. Nice to see you again. Good afternoon. It's great to talk to you again. When did you start swimming, Jake? Uh, I started swimming when I was about five years old. Uh, my mom kind of got scared because I was uh, I was the type of kid that would I had no fear and I'd go jump off the uh, jump off the <laughs> diving board in the deep end and uh, not really and I didn't know how to swim and I wasn't afraid. Uh, so she threw me in swimming lessons and I've been swimming ever since. Awesome. Now you've been swimming through high school, doing really well for yourself. Yep. I, uh, I swam for four years at the Macaulay School in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And then I'm now in my third year in college. I swam one year at Indiana University. And then I just finished up my second year at University of Alabama. A great place. A great school. So yep. tell us what happened. Tell us your TOS experience, how it came on. Give us an idea of what you had to pursue and what you had to live through. Yeah, so um, I had just finished my junior year season. Um, it was April of my junior year. I had um, I was named a high school All American in the winter from my high school season, and I had a really good year. I was being recruited by schools. I had um, actually just gotten back from a couple of recruiting trips, and I um, I went to practice on a Thursday. And I noticed that my arm turned purple and I had no pain. I had the, o- the only thing that happened was my arm turned purple. And um, so I looked at it and I was like, I had just finished doing something really hard in practice and I was really hot and it was really hot in the pool also. But I was, um, I was like a little weirded out by it. I didn't really understand what was going on, but because there was no pain, I didn't say anything about it. Um, and I had lifted that morning and we did bench press in the morning. So I thought maybe I was just like sore from that or something. So then the next morning I went into practice and this was Friday morning and we also had a lift and it was supposed to be dry land, but we ended up lifting for part of it. And we also ended up doing bench press again, which is something that I think later down the road, when I get to, when I was diagnosed, is something that contributed to that. So I had no pain on Friday. My arm didn't turn purple. Everything was normal. So I, I kind of forgot about the Thursday incident. Um, the weekend comes around Saturday, Sunday, nothing really is going on. Um, Sunday, I committed actually to Swimming College at Indiana University. So I wanted to take a really cool commitment picture. So I went to... Um, I went up on this mountain that we have um, around where I live and I was taking the picture and something I'd always been able to do is I'm able to pop my elbows. I just like hold my arm out straight and I can like pop them. Um, And I couldn't do that. And I felt some tightness and it was kind of bothering me. And I was like, I don't really understand why I can't do this. I was getting really tight. And this, this was just your right side, correct? Yes. This is just on my right arm. Um, so I didn't, I didn't understand like why that was happening, but once again, because I was a swimmer and pain comes at a cost and it's something that I'm used to, I didn't really say anything also. Um, and then Monday comes around and I went into practice in the morning and we were supposed to lift and I went to the trainer and I was like, I can't lift like my shoulder really hurts. And I had a lot of pain and I thought that it was just soreness from bench press. I thought it was delayed muscle soreness from the two lifts on Thursday and Friday. I thought that it was just hitting me. Um, And so I was like, okay, can we just like stretch out that area and um, maybe it'll feel better uh, and I'll be able to swim in the afternoon. And so, uh, so we did what is called a pec release where he dug into my pec minor to try to release the muscle because we thought that's where the tightness was. And, um, 
and it only made it more sore. So um, practice that afternoon. I went in. I kind of halfway did it. I couldn't really – I could swim, but it was painful. So, like, I kind of backed off a lot in what I was doing. Um, and I went home, and I actually told my parents what was going on. I told them, hey, like, I'm having some pain. Um, I didn't really have a lot of discoloration, maybe a little bit, but um, hmm. it was mostly just pain in the shoulder area. And I still couldn't now, pop my elbow. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Your dad is a doc, a high level doc. Yes, my uh, father is a cardiologist. Had so, you told uh, him about your arm turning purple? I forgot to ask you that. I, I don't think I did, actually. Um, I kind of just was like, because it, it, it went away pretty quickly. So I didn't really think anything of it. Um, so no, I didn't tell him. I didn't tell my mom, um, which looking back on it, I probably should have. Um, but I didn't know any better. Um, I didn't know what the symptoms were leading to or anything. I had never heard of thoracic outlet syndrome in the first place. Um, but then, so back to Monday night, I told my parents and my dad took the let's wait and see approach and let's see what's going on. And, um, so then Tuesday morning, I woke up and I could not lift my arm above here and I had a lot of pain. So I went into school and I, we were going to work on it with the athletic trainer. Um, and we were going to do that after school. And he is also my anatomy and physiology teacher. And I was taking this class and I had this class that day. And it was about, I was around lunchtime. I was halfway through the class and I raised my arm and I was like, Hey, I had noticed my arm had started turning purple on its own and it had swollen up a lot. It was about twice the size of my left arm. And I raised my hand and I said, Hey, coach Bass, um, I don't think my arm is supposed to look like this. Like, is this, a, is this normal? Is this okay? Um, and he looked at me he's like, no, this is not okay. So we finished out the class and he walked outside into the hallway, called my mom and was like, he needs to go get this checked out as soon as school is over, like right away. So we had next to my high school, there was a orthopedic clinic. So, um, and that's where we, that's where our athletic trainers sent all of our athletes for sports related injuries. So they sent me there and, um, the doctor looked at me and he was like, you, you got to go to the ER. Like we we're not equipped to take care of whatever's going on here. And I had had a teammate at the time who had suffered from epi episodes of rhabdomyolysis. Um, and we had thought that that was what was going on. But when he had it, it happened in both arms and they would swell up. And so we thought it was a little weird that it was happening in one arm and not the other. Um, so I went into the ER and um, they did blood work and they did an ultrasound. And now my dad, he was actually working at the hospital at the time. So he came back into the emergency room with me and he waited in the room with me. Um, and I had been around ultrasounds enough to kind of know like what they do and like mm -hmm. how to read one to a certain extent, like a base level knowledge on how to read one. And the ultrasound was like, it felt like an eternity. It was like 30, 45 minutes. And I was also freezing in that, uh, that room. And it was like really, really dark in there too, for some reason. But I remember, and I know the ultrasound technicians, they couldn't say anything to me um, because like they have to have the doctor read the ultrasound first, but I knew that there was a point in time where during the ultrasound, when they're pressing deep on veins and he was pressing on other parts of my arm, trying to read something up here in my shoulder, that something was not quite right. Um, I know that they do a thing on the ultrasound where they can listen to the blood going in and the blood going out. And you can actually see that where one side will be red and one side will be blue representing the blood flow in and blood flow out. Right. Okay. And he did that on me. And so I was at an angle to where I could turn my head and like see the actual screen of what the ultrasound was doing. And he did that and nothing happened. 
There was no sound. There was no blood going in, no blood going out. And so I, to, I, to interrupt for a second for our listeners, the and Jake, you already know this, the uh, waveforms in the arteries are very mm -hmm. different than the waveforms in the veins. The arteries have high pressure and high velocity. And the veins really depend a lot on gravity and it's slower flow under low pressure. Uh, what the sonographer is probably doing was called augmentation. You look at some part up here in the proximal arm and you squeeze the distal arm, hoping that that rush, that low pressure vein will then go through and show you the vein that's up higher. But in yeah. your case, you had a blood clot. Yeah. And so you're there for a long time just saying nobody's saying a word. You're probably yeah. freaking out a little bit and your dad too. Yeah. I, um, uh, I just like, I knew right away that something was wrong. Um, but and I asked him, I was like, Hey, like, is everything going okay? And, um, and he looked at me, he's like, you know, I don't know yet. Like I, yeah. I gotta wait to see the doctor, like look at it. And I was like, something's wrong. Like I knew something was wrong right away. And my dad was standing in the corner of the room. Um, he had been watching what was going on. And I remember when, um, when the technician left the room, it was just me and my dad. And he had went to like a subway in the hospital or whatever to get me some food because I hadn't eaten dinner and I was starving. Um, and we were just sitting there talking. And I could tell like growing up, like I've always looked at him as being he's a doctor, but he's also my father. But sometimes like, um, sometimes I could tell when he went into doctor mode and sometimes I could tell when he went into father mode and I was in his natural place where he works, like where he would normally be full doctor mode. And I saw him trying to work with himself in a way and being a father at the same time. And I thought that was something that I, looking back on, I something I really needed because I needed him to be a father in that moment. I didn't need him to be a doctor because there were so many doctors working already. And I was, I was terrified. I had no idea what was going on. All I knew is that something was wrong. Um, so the blood work that they had done came back uh, negative for rhabdomyolysis, negative for anything else. Um, so it was fine. And then I was like, okay, something's wrong. I, I think that I have a blood clot because of what I had saw on the ultrasound. And so, um, so my dad and I were talking a little bit and he said, yeah, that's a possibility. Um, but we're going to need to know like what the extent of it is and whatever. And then the doctor comes in and is like, Hey, so you have a lot of blood clots. It wasn't just one blood clot. I had a lot, I had extensive spidering, right here mm -hmm. in um my shoulder and they're like you oh, by that specialist. you mean there were new veins showing up here yes there were uh, i had a i had a lot of new veins and they um they would stick out a lot too um so the doctor told me that and instantly like from an emotional standpoint i was it was like my world just stopped right away um you know i went from being on this high of committing not two days before that and i had my life planned out i was like i'm gonna go on i'm gonna do all these things in swimming i knew like from a team aspect i knew that our high school team had a really good opportunity of winning a state championship we had a lot of pieces returning we didn't really lose a lot of points and all of a sudden I was like, well, that's out the window. Like I can't uh -huh. compete. I'm not going to be able to like, um, and just everything just stopped. And I remember something that will always stick with me is when the doctor walked out and it was just me and my dad in the room afterwards, he looked at me and he, and I'm, I'm terrified he looks at me and he's like, Hey, everything's going to be okay. We're going to get you the best help that you can get. And we're going to help you as best as possible. And I, that's, that's what I needed to hear. Um, they put me in a sling and I drove home on my own. I, I needed to be alone in that, 
in that drive home, just so I could kind of uh, collect my thoughts. I was, um, man, I was, I was really scared. Um, I got home and I remember the doctor had said, I need to sleep with my arm elevated. So we put a pillow underneath my arm. I didn't really sleep. Um, I found myself a lot of times at night where I just stare at the ceiling and I'd be crying. And I was like, God, like what's going on? Um, I was so scared. I didn't know. I, I thought that my life was over. I thought that I was so scared that, and I didn't know the extent of what was going on. I was like, I was so scared to go to sleep because I thought that mm. I would throw a clot and not wake up and my parents would find me not alive in my bed the next morning. Um, and so I really struggled sleeping that night. I talked to my parents a lot. Um, I talked to God a lot. I was like, God, like, I don't know what's going on. Like, why, why is this happening to me? Why, why did you pick me? Why at this time? Like, this was the worst timing possible. I had just completed something I dreamed about doing. I was excited to get back to work and work towards new goals. Um, and all that was gone. So I woke up the next morning with very little sleep and I was really hungry. Um, and I walked downstairs and my parents were waiting for me at the bottom of the staircase. And I was like, oh, great. Um, well, can you we imagine how, they, how, how badly they slept that night? Oh, well, they didn't sleep. They spent the entire night actually um, researching my condition. They had oh. kind of discovered that it was thoracic outlet syndrome, but they honestly didn't know much about it because there isn't a lot of literature out there about thoracic outlet syndrome, about it happening in athletes, about it happening in, ge happening in general. So we didn't really know much. Um, but uh, my dad had gotten in contact with a surgeon and they, he had fit me in that morning. He was like, I made time. I emptied my schedule, come in this morning. Um, so I couldn't eat and I was really frustrated because I was really hungry. And on top of being sleep, uh, sleep deprived and all the emotions that were going on, I was like, man, I, like I'm starving. I just want something good to eat. Um, so my dad had to go to work and luckily the hospital that he was working at was like two minutes away from the place that I was going to see the surgeon. Um, so my mom took me there and that's where I met Dr. Fugit, um, who ended up, uh, doing all the procedures that I had done. And I went in and had my first procedure done, which was um, they went into my arm in like a needle and they shot thrombolytics into my arm to break up the clots that I had. Um, and that was kind of the first step in what I had to get done to, um, because of the severity of the case I had, because my arm was so swollen. It was so painful that we knew that we had to get something done and get something done right away. Nice. Um, so I had that first surgery done and then my next surgery happened about two weeks later. And well, that's let's, let's, I, let's take a short break here. Dr. Fugit happens to be a name that I've seen as I know the literature and yes. he's got some TOS experience, considerable yes. TOS experience. You're very lucky. You happen to have his TOS specialist around. And you didn't even know you needed one. Yes, I was. Uh, I was very fortunate, and uh, you know, he did a lot more than just be my surgeon. He was kind of somebody who, um, because he was so specialized in it, um, and he had seen a lot of cases. He was somebody who I looked at, and I was like, "Am I like? Am I going to swim again? Am I going to be okay? Am I going to be able to have the life that I had before back?" Um, and he was somebody who gave me hope and that was something that I needed a lot because I had absolutely no hope at no. all. You um, know, a lot of, a lot of our viewers go through different kinds of docs and I yeah. have not met Dr. Fugit personally, but from what you've told me before and today, he, 
it sounds like he's got that quality that's so important for a TOS specialist, that empathy. Yeah, he was um, he was tremendous because he he looked at me and he said um, along the lines of I don't know, but I'm going to do my very best to help you get that life back. Um, and we're going to do what, our very best to take care of you. And so that was something that I knew. I knew right away that I was in good hands. Um, my dad had gotten several uh, recommendations about him from his partners. So he had faith in what he could do. I started to get faith um, and hope a little bit. Um, so he had like a, he had an office where they did um, surgical procedures in, and that's where I had my first surgery done. And then, um, then we sat down and talked about the process of going through the next surgery, which was, um, it was where I had my first rib removed. Um, it was a first rib resection. And that was because anatomically I had my costal clavicular ligament insert on the first rib too close to the subclavian vein and it had become inflamed. And that's what caused the pinch in the vein and had caused my symptoms to be onset. And so there was, there's two different kind of procedures on how to go with that. And you can go through the pec muscle and it's a much less risky procedure because you're not going to, um, you're not really going through any nerves or anything. Um, but it takes a lot longer to recover from because you're going through a muscle and the muscle takes a lot longer to recover. And then there was the riskier procedure where we went in underneath my armpit and you had to navigate through the brachial plexus to get to the nerves or to get to the rib to remove right. it much riskier procedure, but much shorter recovery timeline. And obviously I risk um, him nicking a nerve and losing feeling in my arm or uh, even worse. And so don't forget um, also because you're a swimmer, you want to leave some of your strongest muscles alone. You want to avoid them so that your yes. athletic recovery, not just your pain recovery, your symptom recovery, but your athletic recovery is to be preserved. Yes. So um, we decided to go with the more risky procedure because we, I wanted a chance to swim again. Um, that was something that, um, you know, as an athlete, sometimes – they always say, sometimes you don't know how good you have it until it's gone. And having it ripped away from me, I can only imagine. All I, all I knew is that I wanted to get back in the water. I wanted to swim again. I wanted to be with my friends, my teammates again. Cause I mean, honestly, I started swimming because it was fun. And all I wanted to do was to swim because that was kind of like my safe haven in a way um and so i uh, we decided to go ahead with the riskier procedure so that i would leave the pec muscle alone and it would um have a much less recovery time timetable so by the way that, that that's great that dr if you get worked with you and your family to yes, lay out the options was, and give you an intelligent choice Yes, it was something that um, put a lot of prayer into, um, did a lot of research on it. And um, obviously, he felt very confident in doing that procedure. And that's something that made me feel more confident in my family, uh, more confident in deciding to go that route. Um, so we went ahead and did that procedure. And, um, you know, I remember I woke up in the hospital room and I had, it was an overnight procedure, but I woke up in the hospital room and like right away, it was instant sharp pain. Like the second I took a breath in, it was sharp pain. Mm -hmm. And I remember I, I mean, I went through a lot of morphine that night and um, I threw up a lot from it, but um mm -hmm. I was in a lot of pain and my family was there. And that was something that 
meant a lot to me. But something that also stuck out to me was while I was in the hospital, um, there was a, a nurse, or uh, I think it was the janitor actually, who uh, cleaned the room before I had gotten there. And um, she had told my mom, I believe, that, uh, that she had been praying for me before I had even gotten into the room. She didn't know who I was. She didn't know anything about me. But, um, you know, hearing that um, then was something that uh, it meant a lot to me. Um, it helped me know that there were people out there that they didn't even know about me, but they cared about how I was doing. And um, it just was a very positive experience for me. And it's something that, um, you know, that is something that will stick with me for the rest of my life. Um, so after, after that procedure or after that surgery, there's about a two week timetable and I, um, I went in to see Dr. Fugit and he had told me before that procedure that, or that surgery that there was like, I would be able to like barely move my arm up, like just like barely start moving it up from uh, laying down. And it would be a long, it would be a long process to uh, gain that mobility back. And I went into the office and I just raised my arm up here and he was <laughs> like shocked because you're not supposed to be able to do that yeah you're, you're not supposed to be able to do that and i mean i was extremely blessed to be in that position and have that type of recovery um but i mean i i was able to lift my arm up and like that's kind of uh it was one of those baby steps in the recovery process that i was like wow like I can actually do this. Like I can actually recover from this. I can actually move forward and, um, you know, maybe there's a shot I can get back in the water. Um, and so I had my third procedure done, which was a venogram. And, um, I think it was a venoplasty also. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was actually able to get in the water about a week after that. And How long was that after your surgery, Jake? For which one? From the total diagnosis? from the time of your surgery till you got back in the water for the first time? Um, from my first surgery, it was about seven weeks. So mm -hmm. from the second surgery, it was about five weeks. And it was okay. about a week after the third procedure. The venogram and the venoplasty. Okay. Yep. So you get so, in the water. Now it's got to be a big yeah, step for you. That was... Uh, you know, it's a day that's kind of imprinted in my memory forever. Uh, I have this, I have this like kind of routine that I do um, when I'm in a shallow end of a pool. Um, and my high school pool had this and on, my pool at University of Alabama also has, it, has this. So I still do it to this day uh, where I jump in and I would kind of walk out to the middle. And um, that's where like the deep end goes down and I kind of walk and I can just like be above the water a little bit, and like feel the water before I dive all the way in. And I was able to do that. And I just remember I wasn't able to swim. I was only able to kick and it was for about 15 minutes. And um, we just wanted to build back slowly into getting back into the water. And I remember that entire practice. I didn't take my goggles off because I was crying the entire time, but it wasn't because I was sad. It was because I was so overjoyed that I could be back in the water because seven weeks before that, I thought I would never be there again. I never, I, I thought I'd never swim again. Um, so I remember, uh, I remember that day, like it was yesterday. Um, and that was a day that I was like, okay, I, it was another baby step where I was like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. It's going to be hard, um, but I can do this. And I had been working with my athletic trainer, TJ Bass, um, who I was so uh, blessed and fortunate to be able to work with him. Um, this is actually, the guy who also is your anatomy teacher who you scared the heck out of by yes, saying, my uh, arm's supposed to look like this. Yeah, so he's 
he's the one who told me I need to go to the hospital. Um, but I was so fortunate to be able to work with him. He's now right. an athletic trainer at BYU with the track and field team. Um, but I worked with him every single day. Um, and he would massage my scar. He would do go through my PT exercises with me, not just having me do them on my own and him just stand there. He would go through them with me. Um, there were days where I would come in and he could tell that I had had a terrible day. Um, and he would do everything he could to, uh, to like lift me up and know and like help me push through those bad days. He was always positive. And I know that there were days in there and we talk about it still to this day. Um, we look back on it. There were days where he was like, man, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know if he's going to be able to get over this hump, but he never once showed that to me. Um, because honestly I would have been game over if I had heard that, um, if because of how involved he was in my recovery process, he was so positive and beneficial for that. And I was, I was terrified. I was fighting for, to get a life that I had had back. Um, and there were days where he was, I could, I like, I know now that he was struggling a lot and he put on a face and, was positive and helped me and pushed me through. And there were days that I would come in there and I had baby steps where I'd be like, I, I kicked for 30 minutes. I swam for 10 minutes. I swam for, for 12 minutes. I kicked for 25 minutes. I and slowly building up and up and up. And, and I was this, those days where I could, there were days where I was like, Oh, I can swim for 25 minutes. And then the next day I could only go 15 minutes. And I would come in there and he could tell I was visibly frustrated um, because I'm like thinking to myself, why am I able to go for this long yesterday? But now today I can't get anywhere close to that. And, um, you know, he was so helpful in uh, pushing me through and helping me and calming me down in a sense. Um, you know, I, can never like I can't thank him enough um, for all he did for me. But having that positive influence in my support group was it, it was tremendous for me. And it's something that, uh, like you know, I if I would have had somebody negative in that standpoint, I, I probably would have given up. I I don't know what I would done if I had somebody who I thought believed in me saying, Oh, I don't know if he can do this. Um, and there was actually a standpoint where like a point in time where I had gone in to see Dr. Fugit and I didn't see Dr. Fugit at the time I saw, uh, his physician's assistant and she was extremely negative about, uh, me recovering. And honestly, I didn't really pick up on it all that much, but a lot of it was I was like, listen, I was just in there listening, listening to her say this, 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 this is wrong. This is what we're going to do and all those things. And it was way over my head and I was like so overwhelmed. And so I didn't really understand what she was saying, but I was fortunate to have my CRNA was a family friend. Um, her daughter was on the team that I was on. And I had known, I had known them since I was a little kid, since I started swimming and I was 17 at the time. So my mom went and told her that, that she was being extremely negative. And from there on, my point person was Dr. Fugit. He came into every meeting. It was the one talking to me and um, he brought that positivity back that I needed. And, um, you know, He's I think my this mom, and most to us, uh, experienced people realize how important that battle is the emotional yes. battle the support group so that's good yes, he's, got, he's got a good heart to really take over spend his time individually yeah. with you like that you're very lucky yeah that was um it was something that was very fortunate for me because uh you know looking back on it now having that positive support system is it's what pushed me through 
Um, and how long were you doing this PT and the work with TJ before you ended up at Indiana? How long a gap is that in there? Uh, it was about a year and three or four months. Oh. Um, now I had, I had been, I'd worked with him for other injuries, um, wear and tear through swimming throughout my entire high school career. But, um, the really focused work from the time I went into surgery to when I left for Indiana was about a year and four months. And I, I saw him every day except for Sunday, pretty much. Um, wow. And uh, so, but yeah, he, so over the long term, you felt you were making progress as you got closer to school. Um, yes, definitely made progress as a long term. I had some short term success. I actually, um, so I got back in the water in about middle of May and I actually went to my first meet and competed in the middle of June. And it was a meet at uh, Auburn university and I swam, I swam a, a loaded schedule. And I, I just remember, I was like, wow, like I was able to compete again. Um, I, I, I swam really slow. It was nowhere near to where I had been before, but I was so excited just to be able to swim again. Um, and then later that summer, I went to junior nationals out in Irvine, California, and I swam out there and I ended up going, I believe six best times out of my seven swims. And I was like, whoa, like I'm back. I, I felt like Superman. Um, I was back. I was feeling great and I felt so blessed and I had gotten over, it was like, it was like I'd been from the time I had had surgery to honestly then that I was in what I felt was a never ending dark tunnel emotionally. Um, and there were times where I'd wake up in the morning and I would, my alarm would go off and I'd throw it across the room. I'd turn over and just scream into my pillow and be like, I can't do this. Like um, there was times where I would go to bed asking God, I'm like, why, like, why am I here right now? Why are you doing this to me? Um, and there were times where I, where I was struggling so much and I had had so many bad days in a row where I'd go to bed and I was in so much pain, both emotionally and physically, where I'd be like, I'd think to myself, I was like, this pain would go away if I just didn't wake up. Um, and I struggled so much emotionally. And I honestly, some people were able to pick up on it from the outside, but I didn't really tell anybody mm -hmm. about that part of, um, how I was feeling, but um, it was the people around me who were supporting me constantly. It was my mom, it was my dad who went above and beyond to do everything they could to help me get better. It was TJ Bass, it was Dr. Fugit, it was my teammates who I wanted to get back for them. Um, they were my best friends. I'm still friends with them to this day. Um, but it was those people around me who are the reason that I woke up in the morning. I got dressed. I went to practice. I went to school every day. And I would, I would think to myself, okay, this is going to pass. This is going to pass. Um, and during that period of time, I had felt like I was in a never ending tunnel of darkness and there was no light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and when I went to that meet, I felt like there was the light at the end of the tunnel and that I had made it there. Um, and I was so happy because I had never anticipated going a best time again. Um, I never anticipated going even remotely close to the times that I had gone before, but to go a best time, I was like, man, I'm, I'm on top of the world right now. This is great. I, all this pain that I was going through, I'm over it. I am smooth sailing from here on out. And, um, 
you know, God had other plans for me. I, uh, I went to a meet in the fall. I was really excited. I was excited to get back to work. I was like, man, I still have time to make up for the time I missed and I'd be ready for our state championship. I'd be ready for junior nationals in March. Um, I can do this. Like I, I, I'm on a roll. And I went to this meet and I swam five events and you know, I, I was joking around with my friends, having a great time. I was great through the first four events. Not It was an in-season meet, beginning of the season, so obviously I'm not going to go anywhere close to best times or whatever, but I was going times that I thought I could go at the beginning of the season. I was in the place that I thought I would be. And it was my fifth event, the 200 free, where I got about halfway through and I felt great and I flipped and I took a stroke and my arm just went dead. It was so heavy. It was like the pain that I felt when I had to get out of practice all those times before because I had reached my tolerance and it just got worse. It went numb. It was so heavy. And I, I basically like and the term we use is I sank and the piano hit. Um, it had dropped on me and I died so hard in that race. And I got out of the water and I was like, it's my arm. Like it hurts really bad. Um, so I went in and I saw Dr. Fugit again. And that was from an emotional standpoint, I had gone from again, being back I was back I was back on top of the world I was going best times I was like man like let's do this like I can be ready to go when I go to college I'm I'm dialed in to right back into that darkness um and I went in I saw Dr. Fugit and I was struggling with swelling and um he we went and did a venoplasty and all my swelling went away and I haven't really had swelling ever since. Um, and I was able to get back in the water then. And over the course of time throughout that year and four months before I had got to Indiana, I had only completed really around 30 full practices. And we practice about 10 times a week. Um, I was doing about two thirds of a practice most of the time on average. Um, some days I'd get more, some days I'd get less. And, um, you know, I know it was frustrating for my coach because he had seen me go from having those three procedures and surgeries and three months later go best times to right back and having another surgery. Um, and so I got back in the water and it was a slow process again, building back up, but I was able to, I was able to get better and every day was a fight for me again, but I had begun to saw, see the light again at the end of the tunnel. I had my mom, my dad, TJ, Coach Bass helping me. Um, I had my friends around me supporting me and pushing me to better myself. Um, and about 10 months after I'd gone in for my first surgery, I, um, it was a Friday night of our state championship and I was in finals for the 200 freestyle. I was the, I was the second seed. Um, and I, remember uh now my mom at the my mom growing up she was like the typical swim mom who was all dialed into times what are you going to do splits wise how can we like what are you going to do stroke rate and everything and she asked me um you know what are you going to do for this race like how are you going to swim it like a normal question that she would always ask me and um you know, I, I said, I responded and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go have fun. I'm not going to take this for granted. Um, 
and I went out and I ended up winning my first state championship uh, individually um, by a hundredth of a second. Um, and our team went on to win the state championship that we had set out to win as a team the year before and the one that is what helped me keep going and pushing forward. Um, about a month later, we went to junior nationals. Let's take a little breath here. That is really yeah. inspiring to hear those challenges, external yeah. and internal, and to get to this point. I just think it's nice to savor that championship. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a really special moment. Um, you know, we, we beat our rival school. Um, yeah for the state championship and they had won like the past three or four. Um, oh. And it was just, it was. And you helped your team do all this. Yeah. It, um, it was so rewarding to see all of that work come to fruition oh, nice. and be able to um be able to enjoy those successes. And I know looking back, I was like, man, I am so extremely blessed by God to be, uh, to be in this position. Cause I mean, 10 months before I was in a hospital bed yeah. in the ER yeah. with no idea if I was going to make it through the night. Um, well, well, I hope somewhere there's a video of your mom jumping up and down and going crazy for just a little while there. Yeah. Cause... There's a, we have a, we have a picture, um, where I had just jumped off the podium and I remember I gave her a hug and we both just started crying. And um, it was a special moment that I still have that picture and I still look at it every once in a while. And it's something that uh, beautiful. it means a lot to me because I know, I know how much she, um, how much she went through. I mean, I seeing your child go through this is um, it's a bit different experience than actually going through it, but it's, really hard to um i can imagine for her it was really hard and um i know it was hard because i saw her on days um where it was really hard for her um but knowing just sharing that moment with her was uh it was awesome well, she um, deserved it i'll bet yeah. you when you're a she, parent you'll realize even more how strong both your yeah. parents must have been through all this she put everything into helping me get better and um you know sharing that moment with her was Excellent. so special um so then after the state championship um and and mind you during that meet uh in the 200 free i dropped over three seconds in that event from what i had gone the year before so i was like wow this is pretty good i maybe i can do something else in uh in another event and um uh, my best event in high school was the 200 backstroke, but you can only swim that at club events. You can't swim that at high school events because it's not in the high school mm -hmm. lineup. So I got to swim that about a month later at um, our junior national championships in Orlando, Florida. And I went in with the mindset of, I just want to have fun again. I just want to race because racing is what I love to do. And I went in there and I had one of the races of my life. Um, it's one that I'll always remember. And, um, you know, I was always trained through coming up. I was always trained as somebody who, if, you, if I'm behind, which a lot of times I'm behind going close to the end, that if I can see you, I'm going to run you down and I'm going to give it all for you. And I'm going to, if I'm going to, either I'm going to scare you or I'm going to out touch you and I'm going to come, I'm either going to come up to short or I'm going to run you down and beat you. But it was something that I love to do. It was like kind of an adrenaline rush, but I was also trained to do that. And, um, I had a coach later on tell me, um, you know, when you, for people who are so good at back halfing, um, and it's something that I did to win my state championship. I came back from a second back on the last 50 to out touch him. Um, those people 
typically go to a dark place at the end. And that's what gives them that extra burn, that extra drive to move forward and to like get that extra 5% at the end that a lot of other people can't have. Um, and I, quite honestly, I, I went to that dark place and um, I, I flipped at the 150 and in my mind, I, in my mind is in two different places. I was racing and um, I saw the guy, I saw the guy flip ahead of me and I was like, okay, I can run him down. And now in my other part of my mind, I saw in my head um, a memory from my second surgery where I was wheeled out of the mm. hospital room pre-op. And my dad got to go back into surgery with me, and, which was something that I needed because he knew everything that was going on because he was a physician. And he was like, this is what they're going to do. This is where you're going. Oh, this guy, he's great um, at, what you're, at what he's doing. You're going to be just fine. And that's something that I needed to hear in that process. Um, but I saw going down the hallway, looking back, my mom just standing there crying and that memory for me is what gives me my drive at those, at the end of those races is seeing her and knowing I, th this was the pain that we all went through. Um, and so I, I flipped there and I was about 1.2 seconds behind the guy and I ran him down and I out touched him and um, I was able to win my uh, first junior national championship. Um, I remember after I went up on the podium, like I was so excited. I ran around the pool deck to find my mom. Um, and I just remember like I saw her down the, at the end of the pool and I just sprinted to her and gave her the biggest hug. Because once again, it was another moment where um, all that hard work, all that pain had finally paid off. And it was something that I never thought I'd be able to do. And it's something I was so blessed to be able to do. Um, but those were like the two experiences in the span of 11 months that were like, wow, like I am truly blessed to be in this position. Um, and I'm blessed to be able to share my story too. That's great. Do you want to go next to being in Indiana or do you want to tell them about Alabama? Down, um, it up to you. Let's so see where, where he goes. My, so my freshman year, I went to Indiana university and um, now something going back before that, something that coach Bass and I had done um in my recovery process and it's something that um so i had this training table in the macaulay athletic room which was my high school and I, I would always go to it and something we would do from a very early period in my recovery is after i would get out of practice my arm would be swollen most of the time so i would go in there and we had a little stretch cord that we attached to the ceiling and hooked through the ceiling tiles and hung down and I would, we would wrap my arm in an ACE wrap to mm. help drain the blood out of my arm. And I would just sit there for like 30, 45 minutes and have mm. it hang right there. Um, and I actually came back uh, about Thanksgiving break in my freshman year and that cord was still hanging there. Um, so that was something that was really cool, but it was something that I had to do every single day um, as like a recovery method that helped me to be able to be ready to go the next day and try to be a little bit better. Um, and so I was able to do that every single day and that it was something that I found that helped me. It helps me to do my best. And so um, when I got to Indiana, um, there were times and practices where I still had to get out because it would get really heavy. It would start to swell a little bit. Um, and the trainers were really accommodating. I'd be going, I'd go up to them. I'd be like, Hey, this is something that I've had success with doing that helps me feel better. It's not a wrap. It's not an instant relief, 
but it helps me feel better over the next hour, two hours, the next day. And it's something that I need to do to be able to go again the next day for practice. And so we would wrap my arm and hang it. Um, this was during the year that right before COVID happened. So um, I struggled a lot mentally there. And because I think my support system was so far away, and that was something that uh, it was a totally different environment for me. I grew up in the South. I was a Southern boy. Um, and so I decided to, when we went home for COVID, because everything was shut down, I was swimming in a river, uh, in the Tennessee River for a couple months. I would put a wetsuit on and swim with a couple of my buddies uh, who are also in the same situation as me. And we just swim for hours and um, I realized that I, I got that joy again because I was with my support system and I was close to them and I was having fun again doing swimming because a lot of people during that time period, uh, they just took the time off and I wanted to keep swimming. I wanted to keep um, training. So because I knew at any moment we could be called back and things could open back up. So after being home for a little while, I decided that it was in my best interest to transfer somewhere closer to home. Um, now, growing up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I, I knew I wanted to go somewhere relatively close to where I could drive home after a practice Saturday morning and be home by lunchtime. Um, so I could see my parents, I could see my friends, I could see my support system. And, I, and also another place where I could feel like I could, um, another place that I felt like I could be um, better in the little things around me that would help me to feel better both with TOS, but also with my outside life. So I entered the transfer portal and I transferred to the University of Alabama. Uh, which is about just under three hours from where I live. So I could do exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and it's great. I love it there. Um, best decision I ever made was to transfer there. Um, but I have this, and the training staff there are so accommodating because they know, because at, actually at the University of Alabama, before I had gotten there, they had had six swimmers in the, six or seven years before I had gotten there who had all had TOS and had to medically retire from. Wow. So, uh, and that's something I didn't know until I had gotten there. But when I came in there and I was like, Hey, I have TOS. I've had it since uh, I had it. I was diagnosed uh, when I was in high school. I still have issues pop up, up every day. Once in a while I had four procedures, but um but this is what I need to do if I have an issue. I need to wrap my arm. I need to raise it. I need to um, do those little things. And actually, in the process of doing that, we um, developed an uh, activation that I do before practice now where we have a, we have a device called a Venom. And it basically, you put it on your shoulder and you Velcro it around you, around your arm and then around your body. And what it does is it stimulates, it has like four pulsating pods on it spread out around and it stimulates the shoulder um, and it also gives heat. And so I would go into practice about an hour before practice happens. I'd wear that for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And then my athletic trainer would do a pec release, like the pec release that I had the day before I was diagnosed. And what that did for me was it opens up my arm and it opens up my thoracic cavity. It opens up my shoulder area so that when I go into practice, it reduced the amount of, I'd say, episodes that I have where it would flare up tremendously. At Indiana, I'd have an issue like every two, three weeks, sometimes more often, sometimes multiple times a week. And at Alabama, I have an issue maybe once every two months. Um, and it reduced it so much. And 
my coach was so accommodating. Um, I'm so lucky to be coached by him, James Barber, where he was able to look at, um, now I came from a very high volume club and also at Indiana was very high volume. And he was able to look at my previous successes and what I was able to do after my first semester there and realized that I, my best times, my best swims have come from when I'm doing less and I'm also coming back from time off. Hmm. And um, so we found that doing less for me yardage wise was what was going to bring more success. Hmm. And, um, you know, I've had two great years swimming with him and um, you just so right. Yeah. I, uh, we just finished our season in March um, and I had, the best success I've had where I placed 15th at the NCAA championships in the 200 back and nice. became an all American. Nice. Um, but I've been blessed to be able to work with him because he, he was able to recognize that I had this issue and because I went through this, I also was able to educate myself on what, what I was going through and know my body more better than anybody else and what works for it and what doesn't work for it because we had gone through so many different trial runs on what was going to help me recover better what's going to help me get ready for practice better what's going to help me be able to do this better and that better and he was able to realize that i i kind he kind of let me take ownership of what i was doing and not be super overbearing and he's like you know, if you know something's going to happen, because there's some times where I can say, I'll be like through the warm up and I'll be like, man, I know something's going to happen. And it's not happening right now, but it could happen about a 200 later. It could happen about a thousand later. It could happen 2000 later. It could happen during the warm down. It's going to happen at some point in this practice. And I can tell him, be like, hey, James, like something's going to happen. I need to shut it down and do something different and um could be like okay let's modify it so that you don't have to get out all the time and there's sometimes where it just comes like that and i didn't know it was coming and i have to get out and he's very understanding of that and that's something that through my process has helped me a lot is knowing that he's Hmm. now it's very well that he could be very frustrated with me and just not show it but the way he shows me that he's understanding and caring he's like hey are you doing okay afterwards um it's something that is another positive influence in my support Mm -hmm. system and it was a great addition to my support system and um has helped me tremendously both as a mentor and as a coach and um he's kind of like that fatherly figure in tuscaloosa that i have where my dad's in chattanooga um But overall, great experience there. I love it at Alabama. I'm excited to come back and swim again next year. Um, I can can imagine, Jake, when you went to them and said, you know, I have this thing called TOS. You don't know what it is. And they said, oh, yes, we do. Yeah. It was surprising. It was was definitely something that kind of caught me off guard because I I hadn't met anybody who had had it. I had never even – I hadn't heard of it myself. Um, but you know, both coaching staffs in general were very accommodating because I know when I was being recruited and I had just committed and I'm, bam, I'm diagnosed with this. I had to call my head coach and I'd be like, Hey, I was just diagnosed with this. I don't know if I'm ever going to swim again. Um, and you know, he was, uh, he was like, Hey, you have a roster spot if you are able to still swim. Right. Either way, we still want you to come here and be a part of this team. Like I could be a manager or whatever, because he still wanted me to be part of the team. Um, And then when I came to Alabama and when I was in the transfer process, I had to once again say, hey, I I was diagnosed with this in high school. Um, You know, this is how I deal with it. I have issues every once in a while, but obviously I – still had the results that I had from before where I had gone best times and I had dropped time and showed progress of improvement. And they took a chance on me and said, Hey, you know what? Come in here and we'll, let's work with you. Let's, uh, let's go do something special. 
And so uh, I've been blessed to be in a great situation there. So where are you now? And tell us a little bit about your career as we've talked about. So right now I'm finishing up my, I just actually finished final exams for my junior year. Um, and I'll be going into my senior year right now. I'm at home in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I'm pursuing a career, uh, hopefully in dentistry. Um, and I'm spending my time at home for the next month or so shadowing different dentists and different specialties and kind of getting a feel for, um, dentistry. I want to, I always wanted to be in healthcare and um, I feel like after my experience, helping people is something that uh, means a lot to me. And I want to be able to um, help people the way that Dr. Fugit was able to help me in the aspect of giving me hope. Um, you know, I feel like I can have an impact on people's lives. Um, as a dentist and mm -hmm. also sharing my story like this. Like, I hope that, um, I hope that somebody out there finds hope in realizing that that's great. Even if you're diagnosed with TOS, that your life doesn't stop it. it yes. It sucks to be diagnosed with it. It's really hard and it is a brutal process to go through but your life doesn't stop. And it doesn't mean that you can't achieve the goals that you have. It doesn't mean that you can't still have the life that you want. It doesn't mean that you can't strive every day to continue to be better and help recover in it as best as you possibly can and make your life as, um, make your quality of life as, uh, as best as it can and improve that. And, um, you know, I hope that I can show to people that I'm a beacon of hope that if I can do it, you guys can do it. Um, you know, it's a, it's a hard process. It's uh, emotionally draining, physically draining. Um, you know, it, it tests you. Um, I was pushed to my limits a lot during it, um, both mentally, physically. Um, but I'm a firm, my faith is really important to me and I'm a firm believer that every test that God gives you, he doesn't give you if he doesn't believe that you can make it through. Well said. Um, and, you know, I believe that God gave me this test as because he knew that I could get through it. And I had no idea that was, this was his plan for me. Um, but I made it through it as far as I know, you know, there's still twists and turns that come through life, but I made it through that test. I feel like, and I came out stronger because of it, because of it, I came out smarter because of it. Um, you know, you, it, it's so hard to push through when you feel like everything around you is crumbling down, but having a great support system, having those people around you who are positive, um, and who are going to be positive even when they are struggling with it too, because you need those people around you who are positive. Otherwise, if they're negative around you, it's going to seep into your mind and you're going to be like, ah, oh, maybe I can't do this. Um, so having those people like my mom and my dad were amazing and so positive throughout it. I know my dad, he didn't really know much about swimming, but he was like, man, I just want you to be happy. I just want you to, I just want you to be happy again um, because he saw that I was struggling a lot. I struggled with my identity as a person because I had what was, what I loved taken away from me. And, um, you know, having, having those people around you is so vitally important. Um, having a plan for recovery, what you're going to do, you know, I was in a position where my diagnosis was so severe and so rapid that, we had to act on it right away. If I wanted to swim again, if I wanted to have a quality of life later down the road. Um, and there's obviously people are in all different types of situations. Now I had a, I had a friend, actually a former teammate who retired from uh, thoracic outlet syndrome last year. Um, and, you know, she was in a different situation than I was. The severity was something that she can live with. So she doesn't have to get surgery. But obviously, 
in making those decisions, there's a risk benefit um, that you have to weigh. You have to weigh the pros and cons. And, you know, I, for me, the pros of having surgery far outweighed the cons, the risks of that, of that surgery that I had for the rib resection, the benefits far outweighed them for me. And I was willing to take that risk. And so it's everybody has a different path. Everybody has a different situation that they're in when they're diagnosed with it. Um, some can be venous, some can be neurological um, related. But knowing that sitting down and realizing, okay, there's these, and sitting down with your doctor and realizing that there's these types of approaches that we can take. You know, if you want to do the surgical route, these are the different procedures that you can take. Um, these are the risks of each, of each procedure, and these are the benefits of each procedure. You know, as an athlete, for me, there was a risk that I would never swim again, but there was even more of a risk if I didn't do anything, I wouldn't be able, I for sure wouldn't be able to swim again. And the benefits of having surgery for me far outweighed the cons of me never swimming again and not having the yeah. quality of life that I wanted. You and your family had to make a bunch of decisions at points where you couldn't see the outcome. We, we yeah. hear your story now. We know the outcome, Jake, but those were tough decisions. And, yes, uh, definitely. You know, it, um, it's it's challenging to listen to your tough days. It's really inspiring to hear the whole story in which you do a great job of explaining. Thank you. <laughs> I just keep thinking thank you, you should be doing a TED Talk. So keep that yeah, in mind. Yeah. Um, Maybe and, one day down the and road. Kudos to your support group. You really had, you know, great mom and dad. I'm sure uh, they must have been going through a lot of stress. It's very hard to see a great doc and his team and your trainer and coach and people yeah, even definitely. along the way. So I'm really thankful that you shared our story, your story with us. Um, yeah, would you definitely. like to take some questions from viewers? Yes, I would love to. Um, I'm an open book. You can ask me anything. Um, you know, I talk about anything throughout my experience. So Jake's experience seems far more severe than some of the other patient speakers that you have had on. Can you talk about that? And this is Dom from Vancouver. So you haven't seen our other patient talks. Yeah, I haven't seen your other patient talks. But, um, you know, I was in a, I had a very rapid case. Um you know, I went from five days, uh, from one day having, from day one, having just some slight discoloration to day five being in the hospital because I couldn't raise my arm. And, um, you know, for me, I think back to, and I mentioned this earlier, I think back to the time where I was, uh, where I had to lift back to back days. And, I still think, and I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I still think that bench pressing those back-to-back -back days, it, it inflamed my pectoral muscle. It inflamed that ligament so much that it was already, I, it was already in the process of pinching that vein as we had seen days before. But that's what sent it over the edge and made it so severe. And, and if it wasn't that, Jake, it would have been the next day or the next Yes, I think definitely. Right. It, was, it was incipient and it was just a matter of time, unfortunately. Yes. And um, also as a swimmer, I'm, I'm taking strokes over arms, overhead strokes constantly. So movement of that shoulder and that overhead motion is also something that can lead to it. And, uh, you know, that could have also been the cause of doing it. Um, but because I was in such a severe and rapid case. We had to make all those risk benefit decisions like very fast. Yep. And, um, you know, being able to, like I said earlier, being able to have, um, I was, I was so blessed to have my dad be a physician because I looked to him for so many of those decisions. Cause I was like, you know, this world way more than me. Um, and so having him as a doctor, and also as a father and him being able to balance that for me was something that was so vital to me and uh, my process. And um, that's great. And being able to have uh, Dr. Fugit also uh, being able to have him help me lay out those uh, treatment plans and be able to help 
me and my family come to those decisions so rapidly and knowing that we are on a time crunch, mm -hmm. but being so accommodating and understanding was something that also meant a lot. Now, compared to other patients, I, I don't know how much you know about this, Jake, but of all patients with TOS, the venous type is pretty rare, maybe three to 5%. And as you know, a pretty dramatic presentation, your arm turns purple, the veins show up yeah. underneath the skin on your shoulder, your arm turns heavy and swollen twice the size of the other. Other patients we've had on who had neurogenic TOS, it's usually a more gradual and less dramatic presentation. So you were under this extra stress, as were your parents and your doctors, of this very sudden onset, as you describe very nicely, having to make quick decisions. Um, yeah. And as to Dom's question, of course, um, it's a good question. I think that our other patients weren't pushing their bodies as hard as, you know, this very high level athlete. Um, plus, he's a boy. I know from having my own boy who's a little younger than you. Um, plus, just, you know, you picked an overhead activity. As we discussed yesterday, baseball pitchers get it too because mm -hmm. their arms are overhead at peak stress. And so this is something we're starting to recognize. As you said, you've been through situations where people didn't know what TOS was. Your dad, who's a highly trained expert cardiologist, you know, knew little about it. And we're yeah. trying to change that because it's probably a lot more common than, than we know. But I think the fact that you were an elite athlete in a very competitive, high-stress overhead sport um, really is what made it so dramatic and severe for you. Yeah. And we're, and, we're, uh, glad, we're glad to be at the end of that story to know that things yes, are coming out well. Definitely. definitely. Um, and, and to add on to that also, um, knowing that the Venus is so rare, I also had, and it's undiagnosed, but there's also times where I think that um, I do have some sort of <clears throat> neurological damage. Um and, you know, there's sometimes when my arm gets really heavy that it'll actually go numb. And I've had that happen in races before yeah. where the last 25 where my arm is, it's moving because I'm making it moving, but I can't feel anything. Um, well, uh, and, we, should, we should talk about that afterwards because I don't want to get yeah. uh, too much into your personal medical thing in front of um, viewers. But we can talk about that and how you might address that issue. It would not be uncommon terribly uncommon for you to have a neurogenic component. Um, uh, Steven, hi, Steven. Good to see you again. He says, he asks, do you worry about overdoing it? You know, how do you think about that? How do you deal with that? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. How do you gauge? Yeah. You're, you're pushing yourself hard. How do you gauge when enough is enough? Um, you know, honestly, I don't. I try not to think about that. Um, I try not to think about overdoing it because I feel like if I'm so worried about overdoing it, I can't get to peak performance in training. And so when I, what I try to do is I try to listen to my body as best as I can. Um, and I know what the signs are that come on and where, when my arm will start hurting and, um, and I know what it means to a certain extent from just the experience I have of having it. And so I try not to think about overdoing it necessarily. I try to think about beforehand, especially knowing I have a plan of if something happens, but when I'm in the water and training, I, I like try to forget about it completely because if I think about it, I feel like it's going to hold me back from, pushing myself to the limits that I have to do to be an elite athlete and uh, achieve the goals that I have. So I try to try to not think about it all that much, but have a plan beforehand of, okay, so I am going to, if I get to this point, what am I going to do? And if I get to that point that I'm going to get out and I have to go through my recovery process, and this is what my recovery process is going to be like. And my recovery process is different when I have something happen than when it is, when I have nothing happen mm -hmm. and my activation process is different the next day of if I had something happen the day before, if I didn't have something happen the day before and just kind of going with what my body's feeling is something I try to do. And have uh, you looked, have you looked up pictures of the anatomy? I'm, I know I have, I have, uh, 
I have looked at the anatomy quite a bit. Um, so do you ever visualize, imagine what's going on in your right thoracic outlet, sorry, this side. Do you ever imagine that as anatomic pictures? Um, you know, sometimes I have. Um, sometimes it's a little hard for me to think about it, especially since I had um, – the, the part of the body that I know the best is around that costal clavicular ligament and the first rib insertion in the subclavian vein. Um, and because that's gone, mm -hmm. what I like, because that first rib is gone, it opens up that air, that area a lot more. So um, I guess the part that I think about the most, if I think about it anatomically is not necessarily that region, but, I try to envision the inside of my vein because mm -hmm. the clotting was so bad that there was, I was told there's going to be permanent damage. Um, Some scarring to the veins that yeah. will leave these so, webs that need to be venoplastied. Um, yeah. Not permanent. Do you, on a, on a slightly different but parallel track, Jake, does knowledge about the disease empower you to have better control over that? You talked about being self-aware. Do, do you think that, learning about the disease or knowing a name even has helped you? Um, it, it definitely has. I think, um, I think being more aware of what was going on inside my body, what was causing this, why am I feeling this way? It helped me answer a lot of questions that I was having internally. Um, you know, why am I feeling this way? what's going on inside my body. So being able to learn about the anatomy of what was going on and being able to learn if I do this, this is going to happen. Or if I do something else, this is going to happen. And learning the causes of why I'm feeling this way and the causes of, oh, I feel better because of this. It's a never ending learning process. Um, and I'm still, and I've, uh, I've lived with this for, over four years now. And, um, I'm still learning about it. I'm still learning about different ways that help me feel better, different ways that I can help prevent what's going on. You know, I'm still with my activation process. I'm still adding things to that. There's like, we've added from the time that I started doing it, we've added like four different exercises that we've played around with a couple of mm -hmm. times, seeing if that helps or if that doesn't help and doing them, only at doing only that exercise and eliminating everything else and then doing all of all four of them together or something like that. Um, so it's a never ending learning process and it helps me because I don't like not knowing what's happening. And I'm somebody who's like, I need to know what's going on because I had no idea what was going on at first. And so being able to know that helps me mentally know that I can conquer this. Excellent. Uh, Steven, do you have another question? Um, oh, we have another Jake from Eagle Point, Oregon. How long did it take from your first diagnosis until you were able to compete again? So my first diagnosis was on April 10th, 2018, April 11th, 2018. Um, somewhere in that weekend range. And I first competed in the middle of June. I, th I believe it was June 22nd through the 24th. So like around three months, somewhere in oh, there, wow. two, three months. Um, and you said it was like was, seven weeks after surgery when you got in the water, after yes, your second was, surgery, the first rib resection. Yep. I was back in the water a week after the third procedure. So around seven weeks from the first procedure. Oh. Um, Jake, uh, the other Jake who's asking a question. I don't know if you're a swimmer or you're asking because you're involved in a sport, like rock climbing or whatever. But if you want to clarify why you ask, um, now's time to do it. All right, Stephen. Uh, again, thank you, Stephen. He's one of our regulars, Jake. Um, when you think about the most helpful advice you've received for your recovery, what comes to mind? Oh, uh, man. I think. I think the most helpful advice that I heard was being, uh, it's kind of cliche, but um, 
being able to roll with the punches um, and being able to be adaptable. Um, you know, there's going to be days where things weren't going great and there's going to be days where things are going fantastic. And um, being able to learn and being open to learn what's going to help me recover, um, being open to trying things. You know, I could have been very, oh, that's not going to work and kind of been like standoffish when people would offer different solutions to issues I was going through. And, um, you know, being very open-minded and listening to the people around you because hopefully, now hopefully in everyone's circumstances, the people around you have your best interest in mind. And I had full faith that the people around me had my best interest in mind. And so listening to them offer me different advice and say, hey, let's try this. Let's try something different. And not being against it and being open-minded to different ideas was something that I think was the most helpful advice because it's helped me the most because we've gone through so many different ideas trying to figure out the different ins and outs of how I can recover best. Thank you. All right. Just Ashton. Ashton, when was the moment you started noticing you were overdoing it? Um, honestly, I didn't notice I was overdoing it until I was in the ER. I thought that I was just going through the normal wear and tear of being an athlete and um, competing at a high level and training at a high level. So mm-hmm. I... I honestly did not notice that I was overdoing it or think that I was overdoing it until I was, uh, until I was in the ER. You uh, obviously go through aches and pains and strains and sprains just by pushing yeah. yourself so hard. So how yeah. did you tell um, the difference this time? So I think the the difference I – the difference I could tell was when I couldn't do something that I can normally do. That was, that was where I was like, I would say when I couldn't lift my arm up past here, that was when I noticed, okay, this is something wrong. I need to get this checked out. Like we need to get the ball rolling on this. Um, But overdoing it, I, I I honestly didn't think I was overdoing it. I thought I was going through the normal wear and tear. Um, The only reason I said something was because I noticed I couldn't do something that I normally could do. I also want to remind our viewers that that we deal mostly with neurogenic TOS. And keep in mind, the venous TOS is often fairly dramatic, as in this case with Jake, right? We, We had the episode of the purple arm that went away, but then bang, the swelling and the heaviness. So uh, neurogenic is different. Thanks for the question, Ashton. Jenny from San Diego says, you had such a big support team, including your family, doctors, teammates, coaches. Honestly, I don't have nearly that level of support. I'm struggling with the loneliness, which we hate to hear. Uh, you talked yesterday with us about your support team. You're, I think, very lucky. You have some really good people. Yes, definitely. Um, I I was extremely fortunate to have such a great support team. I think um, I think for the people who are struggling for loneliness and for you, Jenny, um, you know, I think something for me was like I said when I was uh, when I was in the hospital and um, I had that janitor tell my mom that uh, she had already been praying for me before I'd even gotten there. Um, It opened my eyes up to realizing that just because they don't know the ins and outs of what I'm going through, that there were people around me who I had no idea who they were, who cared about how I was doing. Um, And so for you to know that There are people out there who you don't know are that care about you, but there are people out there who care about um, you and want to help in a way. And sometimes, you know, um, 
sometimes reaching out to somebody who you not normally would reach out to is always a great first step. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm an open book. You can contact me through social media. I'm always here to help out. Um, I mean, I went through it myself and, um, I'm always open to helping other people who are going through it. I mean, working with Dr. Warden, um, you know, he's great. And also being able to reach out to different people who kind of know about what TOS is. And I think that's something great that, um, what Dr. Warden is doing is helping people out there who are struggling through this. You know, I, I wish for my experience that I would have had this, um, and been able to learn more about TOS and know that there's people out there who are specializing it. And there's people out there who are willing to help people go through it. Um, you know, I myself have uh, started a, I started a website myself called Thoracic Outlet, help for thoracic outlet.org, um, where it kind of goes through my story a little bit more. And the idea behind it is to help people out there like you who are going through this, who are struggling through loneliness, know that there's people who have gone through what you're going through. And there's people that care about, um, about you and want to help. Thank you. Very well said, Jenny. Uh, I'll just add that we know that depression goes along with a lot of uh, TOS patients. In the past, we used to see patients, I'm talking when I first started this more than 20 years ago, we would have patients who've been uh, non-diagnosed for 5, 10, 15 years. And after a while, uh, the new doctor they would try would say, you're just depressed, go to see a psychologist. But the fact is that chronic pain and the the lack of anybody who understands why the chronic pain is there will cause depression in a lot of people. Uh, loneliness, you know, feelings of just like, what do I do? Where do I go? You know, Jake is very lucky. Besides his support group, he had Dr. Fugit, who's a published guy in TOS. You know, it's you can't find TOS specialists just by opening up a phone book. So understanding your disease, gaining knowledge of it. Um, that's why I asked Jake questions about, did he feel empowered by having a name at least? or being able to look up anatomy. So educational resources can help sharing with other people. And we're glad to connect you with some of our previous patients, Jenny, if if they're up for it, and usually they are. Um, you, you need to understand the disease as part of the empowerment, but you do need a support group. And if you don't have one readily available, then you need to take extra breaths and understand that it is natural to get sad or even depressed uh, from chronic chronic pain. Um, I'm sorry, and I hope we can help you in some way. Reach out to us uh, through my website. Um, also, Jake, your dad did a great video telling your story. If you want to share that website, what's the address? Um, yeah, so the website that we've developed is called helpforthoracicoutlet.org. Um, and on there, we have a documentary that kind of goes through um, my process in a more in-depth way. Um, and it talks to people in my support system, talks through my parents and talks to me and my personal experience, kind of like I've told you guys today. And Dr. Um, Few gets on there. and Dr. Few gets on there. My coaches are, are on there and my trainer's on there. And it kind of goes through what I, what I shared with you guys today. And it's another way to help people know that there's people out there who have gone through this and, um, once again, show people hope and uh, knowing so, that people have gone through this so you guys can make it through it too. So we're encouraging everybody who's viewing this. And I'm doing a blog post shortly that says, take a look at this and help spread this kind of word. It's a great yeah. success story. Very encouraging. Yeah. Um, JD in Portland says, you mentioned positivity of both you and your doctors. This is so true. What strategies do you use to stay positive personally? Yeah. So now that you're migrating into this field of being an adult yourself, yeah. How do you, how do you do um, in these gap years when you're not with your family, you're not with your doctor, yeah. you're not with JT? Um, you know, I, I've I've moved away from home now, so um, I'm only home from about a month now. But um, you know, I found people around me um, who I can go hang out with throughout the day. Um, or on the weekend or when I'm having a hard time and not necessarily have to talk about the issue of what I was going through, but 
just be there with them and helps me forget about it. Um, and they make me laugh. Like I have great friends who make me laugh. Um, you know, being, being around the people who, um, they may not necessarily have gone through something like this, but, you know, finding the little things that enjoy that I enjoy through life, like something that brings me a lot of joy is being able to walk to class. Um, I live right off campus, but I'm able to walk to class and I just put in my earbuds. I listen to some music and just being able to look at nature around me and the beautiful campus that I'm on. Um, for me, going to practice is something that um, helps me stay positive in my uh, in my recovery process because it's like you know i developed such great gratitude because i had swimming taken away from me so every day i go to the pool it's kind of like a blessing and um it's something i'm always thankful when i walk through the doors into the locker room when i walk out and walk through the doors to the pool it's something that i realize that i'm so incredibly blessed to do and it's something that helps me um stay positive but i also I, I was able to find a support system away from home. Um, and that's something that helps me is just being around people who are positive um, because that's what helps me stay positive and, um, you know, finding some hobbies. You know, I, uh, one of my friends fosters puppies every once in a while. And I don't think I could foster puppies personally, but, um, and I really want a puppy down the road, but I, I get to go and hang out with the puppies that he fosters. And it's something that brings me a lot of happiness because I miss my dogs at home and um, just being able to be around them is something I love to do. And so kind of have a hobby in that. Um, but yeah, making sure I have hobbies is something that helps keep me really positive in what I'm doing and um, helps me keep me grounded. And then also, um, like I said earlier, my faith is so incredibly important to me. And, um, you know, I, I always had a relationship with God, but um, my relationship is so much deeper now that I've gone through this. Um, and so talking to God every day and saying like, hey, uh, I know you already know this, but I went through this today. Um, it was great. Or I went through this and it really it was really bad today. I know you already know, but, um, <laughs> you know, I'm struggling a little bit to realize like what's going on. I'm trying to stay positive, but just being able to talk to God for me is something that, um, something that helps me stay positive. Cause I know that, um, through this experience that there's a plan for me and just mm -hmm. being able to trust in that plan, even though it can be really hard, uh, it helps keep me grounded in what I'm doing. Thank you for sharing that. The, the foster puppy sounds like a good person. It would be yeah. really hard to adopt you know, pets and then give them away to other people. Yeah, so. I've, I've been close to adopting um, a couple of times because the puppies are just so much fun and so cute to be They're around. Full of life. Yeah. Like kids. Um, let's see if we have another question here. And otherwise, oh, and I see Bakhtiar is here. Hi, Bakhtiar. If you're still there, good to see you. All right. So, Jake, um, first of all, uh, thank you so much for sharing something so personal and, and challenging. Yeah. Uh, second, you do a great job. You, you really um, are heartfelt and you, you have a beautiful way of using your words to describe things. It um, filled me with emotion at many points where you, you're describing your challenges as well as the victories. So uh, I think all of us here wish you continued uh, great success and we want to share your progress. So hopefully we can have you back a little bit in the future, maybe after Thank you've adopted you, a puppy. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, we'll get some video of you throwing a Frisbee back and forth with your dog. And we'll say um, also kudos to your support team. I have met your dad on the phone and uh, very impressed by him. And I can only imagine the stress he and your mom went through trying to deal with this. So I'm sure they're very strong and your coach TJ and Dr. Fugit, who hopefully I'll get to speak to in the future. Um, a great story. We're really thankful. Again, uh, helpforthoracicoutlet.org, right? Yes, helpforthoracicoutlet.org. Um, and we'll definitely send some people your way, and let's hope people connect through social media. Yeah. Um, anything else to, to finish us off with? Any notes you know, or thoughts? Um, you know, I hope that there's somebody out there that I was able to help. Um, it, Thoracic Outlet is something that's, um, for me, it was relatively very unknown. 
um, and it can be a scary place, but um, I just encourage everybody to find the people around you, uh, search for the people around you, reach out for help. I know Dr. Warden's willing to help. I know I'm willing to share my story and help people around me, um, but just know that there's people who have gone through what you're currently experiencing and um, there's people who have gotten better and knowing that your life doesn't stop and you, your life isn't defined by having TOS, you know, you're the person who defines your life. You define what you do. Um, and just don't let, don't let an obstacle in life define you. Don't let TOS define you. You define who you are and you define how you want to live your life. Wonderful. Take control. Excellent. Uh, again, I encourage everybody to visit toseducation.org to keep up on our latest schedule of speakers. Uh, this is Dr. Scott. We're in the TOS guy saying thank you again to Jake Markham and his family for sharing. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all back soon. Take care.